You're listening to the Astro Backyard Podcast. Capture the night sky. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Astro Backyard Podcast. My name is Steve Malia, and with me, as usual, is Trevor Jones from astrobackyard.com. Today, we have a really cool topic we want to talk to you about. Uh, Trevor, you want to tell them what it is? Today, we're going to have my favorite type of telescope, and that is a small one. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking about some small apochromatic refractors. Uh, I've, I've used quite a few of them now, and um, I really love them. Yeah, and I've, I've got a list of uh, small refractors as well, and, and actually one Mac, but mine aren't uh, uh, apochromatic. Mine were acros. Um, right. And you can still have a lot of fun with them. You can do a lot of great, great viewing and imaging. Some people have done some great imaging with it. I've done a little bit. Um, well, I've only just done a little bit of imaging myself personally, but um, you can still get a lot of enjoyment out of these little scopes. And you'd be amazed at what they can do, and they're not really that expensive for, for what they are. No, and especially when you're talking astrophotography. Uh, I mean, the, the apochromatic scopes uh, go up a little bit in price, but as long as you stick with that um, 80 millimeters and under segment, um, they're actually quite affordable for the, for the performance. Yeah, and not only that, but with the smaller scopes, you get that nice wide field. So those really big objects... That's um, my absolute favorite part about the whole thing is that yep. you can fit all the targets in there. You can often get two subjects in one image, um, but I'll, I'll go back to that soon. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I was writing down a list of scopes that I've owned in the past uh, or that I still have uh, that will classify as a small scope. So we're saying anything like below 90 millimeters. So uh, mm-hmm. up to 80, right? Mm-hmm. Is I say is a, a good fair number for it. Um, uh, any of our listeners that might have owned a, uh, a Unitron or a, a Sear scope um, uh, long ago, you know the the big scope was a sixty millimeter because uh, usually there might have been like a fifty millimeter uh, refractor. But now uh, we can up that a little bit. Um, so like I used to have a really cool one from Stellar View uh, called the Nighthawk, and it was an eighty millimeter. Uh, acrochromatic um and the thing was built like a tank this thing was heavy um and out what really impressed me on it is the dew shield well it, it was a sliding dew shield but the cap it didn't pull off you had to unscrew it off and it was just a solid piece of aluminum yeah uh, that was a great little scope and, and you know you use it for milky way um uh surfing uh mm-hmm. sw- sweeping the milky way that's it you can see so many great objects with it, um, and because it was, I was using it for visual. You know, color correction didn't matter because it all looked like a gray fuzzy patch, anyways. <laughs> uh, you know, one a real popular one out there uh, is from Orion, their ST80 short tube 80. It's an F5 uh, low cost scope. You can pick them up on the used market for about a hundred bucks. Um, the uh, new, you know, 180 or so, right? Uh, you get a couple of options on it, uh, rings mm-hmm. and uh, finder. That, that's a good one. Um, uh, I've had the Mead Series ETX90, which is a Mac. Uh, that's a great scope. It's an F... Ooh, I think it was an F11. Right. Right, or F13. It was up there. Good for planets. Excellent mm-hmm. for the lunar lunar stuff. Um and uh, then this one, I sold, I sold a lot of these, was made by Antares. It was an 80 millimeter F6, similar to the, the Nighthawk. Um, very, very powerful scope for what it could do. It was a bit of a sleeper. You know, the scope sold for a couple hundred dollars. I can never keep it on the shelf. Uh, once word got out on cloudy nights about the, about the performance on the scope. And it would, um, you know, you could take the thing up to 200 times power. And it would still be tack sharp. It was just something about that lens. That, I remember hearing about that scope. It uh, has a legendary reputation. Yeah, it, it, and <laughs> and I and they don't. It it's not made anymore. And we looked into it for a while. Um, I talked to Glenn at uh, Sky Instruments, um, and uh, he said he can't make them because the manufacturer for the lens isn't getting back to him for some reason, or uh, they don't oh, okay. make it anymore. But um, yeah, it was like like owning a Tim Hortons. Right. Yeah, it was no, like a, it was like a one of those situations where it was 
uh, overperforming for its price. And yeah. as soon as everyone found out about it, they were snatching them up. That was it. There were, I had one. I had one left, and uh, somebody found out and they bought it for me, and uh, <laughs> I, I was upset because I wanted to keep it for myself. Yeah. But um, you know that that's my uh, that's my um little take on small scopes. Um, little bit of uh, um, knowledge about the Orion ST80, as good of a scope as it is. Um, mm-hmm. the Mead short tube 80 millimeter. It's the same scope, but it's blue. So you, you could usually pick that up around the same price with a tripod. Right. So, so if you if anyone sees it out there and they're wondering and they want to get that 80 millimeter scope, which is not only good for visual use, mm-hmm. right? It's an awesome guider as well because it, it's That's big nice aperture, tip. it's lightweight. Um, you can get rings for it that fit without any issue. The short tube you're talking about, The short about, right? tube, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, I've seen that used so many times for guiding. Yep. The only thing you need to do is stick an extension tube on it when you take out the, sure. the diagonal, and it's a great little guider. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen some pictures of people on Facebook using it for imaging. Mm-hmm. And, and really, when you think about it, an acromat, if you're going to do, especially if you have a mono camera, a small mono camera, it should do really good because you just focus for each filter. That's right. And away you go. So yeah, if you're if you're shooting narrow band, say H alpha, with a mono camera through an acromat, I've heard that there's no there's no difference. No, it it it's it's um quite popular. Even you know I I have a buddy who had a big. Uh, I think it was a, a six inch or an eight inch. Um, oh, what was the name of the company? They, they, but they make big acromats, like okay, really yeah. big. Ac- it's like in like we're talking like F ten, like hundred and fifty millimeter type scopes. Yep. And uh, uh, the name escapes me right now, but they they are um, used specifically for narrow band imaging. It's right. A, and, and it makes sense, really, right? So, um, yeah, that that's my my trip down memory lane with the eighty <laughs> millimeter scopes. Right? Oh, isn't it great? Yeah. So, yeah, I've used um, quite a few um, little scopes now. Um, the first one, I had such a great experience with my Explore Scientific ED80, and that was a triplet. And uh, I actually bought that used from um, a guy I met on a forum. He pointed me to a guy selling it on um, the American classified site, uh, Astromart. So there was a bit of a conversion there, but it was still a great deal. And, man, that was a, an amazing little scope. So it was uh, F6, as I mentioned, uh, a triplet. And I'd say still probably about 40 to 50% of the images in my gallery on my website were taken with that scope. Uh, the focal length was 480 millimeter. So as you can imagine, that, that opened up uh, quite, a, quite a large area of sky, and I was able to capture some, some amazing objects, including uh, Andromeda and Orion and some of those amazing targets for the first time were all through that ED80. Um, and something I wanted to mention about these these little 80 millimeter refractors, and specifically the the APOs, is that the prices will fluctuate between them a lot. But you might notice that the accessories included are are always changing. So you really have to look. Do you need a dedicated field flattener for it? Um, in the case of the new Mead 70 millimeter that I've been using, there's no field flattener needed. It's more expensive, but of course you don't need a 200 or 300 dollar field flattener. Good Some point. of them include uh, uh, an aluminum padded carry case, uh, which is a huge bonus. Um, some of them will include uh, tube rings or the a different t- a style of uh, dovetail mount. So you really want to pick the the best one for for your specific needs. And when it comes to small telescopes, it's all about portability. And uh, the, the, the fact that they're compact and you end up using them more often because they're so convenient to use and so reliable. So, yeah, I would say for anyone for anyone looking at them, really take a good look at the accessories that are included and factor that into the, the overall cost. That's a really good point, Trevor. Talking about size and, and portability, uh, they make an excellent grab and go. And then the, your requirements for a mount are not as extensive as it would be for a larger scope. So you can get a smaller go-to mount 
for less money, takes up less weight. You could probably travel with it much easier as well, um, and, and still do your your imaging if if you wanted to travel out somewhere um, uh, very easily. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you know I, I know we were just going to talk about scopes, but you know one mount that comes to mind. I love this little mount. Ioptron has a mount called the Smart EQ. Um, yeah. It. it you know, it, it's a good little go-to mount. It'll handle a small refractor such as this, and it runs off batteries, AA batteries, eight of them. And he can get easily, with good batteries, you know, four or five hours of, of solid imaging in uh, in a night, which I think is not bad. And but, so um, what's what's the biggest uh, scope you get on a mount like that? Would that be an 80 to 90 millimeter refractor? Uh, 80 millimeter, I, I wouldn't push it beyond that. It's right. only good for like 11 pounds. Um, yep. Uh, so you know you put a small, small little mount on it, a scope on it, and um, a camera, and a, a little guide camera, and, and scope. You know you're pretty much maxing it out. I wouldn't even on even on 80 millimeter. You know a carbon fiber scope would probably be better because it's right. lighter. Yep. Um, but yeah, you can you can still have a lot of a lot of enjoyment with it. See, that's um, why I liked the uh, the William Optics Z61 doublet. Uh, first of all, it uh, performed exceptionally well for astrophotography, but it is because it's so small, I was running that on the Ioptron Skyguider Pro, which is more of a, a camera mount. Uh, I mean, it's a robust one, but with the counterweight on there, it had no problem with uh, long exposure images with the Z61. So, I mean, talk about a portable and capable astrophotography rig. Um, just that tiny Skyguider Pro with the Z61, and uh, yeah, it, it actually, there, you can't you can't beat that if you're traveling to dark skies and you want to do deep sky. Yeah, no, that's a good point because um, that'll that has a built-in battery, so yeah. you know, you don't you don't have to worry about power. Um, no. uh, the whole thing is good, you good don't point. have to plug anything in if you've got um, you know you got a battery in your DSLR. You've got the mount running. Uh, you've got um, a shutter release cable. You can automate your session. You're not plugged into a laptop. Yeah. It's, the, uh, well, the, and and that mount has a shutter release feature built into it. It does, and I never <laughs> ended up using it. No. I'm sure it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you can do your. Uh, um, I think you can set up your your bracketing, your bracketing with uh, on a keypad. It's an option. Um, Crazy. And uh, do everything right from there. You don't have to touch. Touch the uh, camera so no vibration, yep. and uh, just let it go and have a beer. Right. Yep. I um, like the sound of that. Yeah, a, a, or, or or a whiskey, um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, or two. Um, so, oh, you know what? You, you mentioned something. The that Zenith Star was a uh, doublet. Yep. Right. And there was a discussion on on Facebook on one of the forums I belong to, and um, uh, you know there was a couple of points brought up about imaging scopes, and you know you have a triplet like the, your Explore Scientific eighty millimeter was a triplet, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that one is a doublet, and there's some doublets out there that will give a triplet a run for its money, because they have the they have the good glass like an FPL fifty three, which is a synthetic fluoride glass, um, yep. and they're corrected so well, and the the two elements are are matched so well that they'll give a triplet a run for its money. Mm -hmm. um, so don't get hung up on on a triplet versus a doublet when you get to these small scopes. And when you add more glass, you actually add a lot more weight. Um, so it kind of defeats the purpose of that portability as well. That's right. Um, What's your favorite? Actually, what's your favorite object to image with a wide field scope, Trevor? Like I know uh, you've got a few. Well, when I think of um, a wide field target for for a scope like this, you, um, the North American Nebula and the Pelican Nebula in Cygnus is uh, is pretty massive, and I mean it's just so it's so, such a popular target. You just see it everywhere, all over Astrobin. But it's uh, it's a wide field target that you couldn't dream of shooting with uh, like an SCT. You could you could choose you know the Cygnus wall or something, but to get the full actual North America shape, um, you need a wide field uh, refractor. Um, another point I wanted to bring up, and I hear this a lot, I think there's some confusion, is that so when you compare little 80 millimeter or in the case of the William Optics 61 millimeter refractors, 
you start to get into the territory of comparing it to a telephoto camera lens. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the, the F ratio of these scopes, they're usually um, like the Z61 is F5.9. And if you compare that to a high quality telephoto camera lens, like say the Canon uh, 300 millimeter F4 um, that I happen to own, you say, well, okay, that 300 millimeter lets in, it's faster, it lets in more light. So it's obviously, it's got to be much better than that Z61. Why would, why would I get this telescope when I could get this 300 millimeter F4 um, lens? The difference is I, you'll want to take some test images shooting at F4 because what do those stars look like at the edges of the, of the field of view at F4? You're probably going to want to stop that down to F5.6 or even 6.3 to get those stars nice and sharp. These telescopes were designed for taking pictures of stars. Um, so not only is that focal ratio um, intended for that purpose, where these telephoto lenses aren't, they're, they're designed for taking you know, landscapes and nature photography. So not only that, but focusing using a telescope with a pre precision uh, 10 to one dual speed focuser is so much easier um, than focusing with, with a camera lens. Not, to, not only that, but you can actually lock the focus down. Um, they have the dovetail uh, plate to mount to your, um, your mount. There's just so many advantages to using a telescope for astrophotography over a telephoto lens. That being said, if you already have a nice lens, um, and especially a nice wide field one, they can, they can be a better option, especially when you get into the 200 to 300 millimeter range because there are very few scopes that actually go that wide. So... That's my thoughts on telephoto lenses versus um, small, high-quality APO refractors. That's a very good point and, uh, about the uh, telephoto lens. The, the one thing that comes to mind, too, is, um, and, and I'm, not, I'm not familiar enough with them to, to know myself. Maybe you can, you can tell me. Can, is there, a, like, a flattener that's available you can put? Like, I know you can get um, – Tell extenders for a lens to to increase their magnification, but is there like a flattener type option that you can get that you can put between the lens and the camera body? So those those tele extenders, and, and I've got one that I used for uh, for bird photography because you want to get that reach. Uh, they actually they'll they'll introduce some uh, chromatic aberration in your images. I wouldn't use an extender uh, for astrophotography because uh, you even notice it in in some of my bird images when it, there's bright sunlight, you can see that purple fringe around. Um, you know, branches and stuff. As for a flattener, I've never heard of one for uh, for a camera lens. I think generally they're quite flat. Um, a lot of time and money is invested into those optics um, to produce um, incredible images. So, uh, you know, a high a high end Canon L series lens uh, will be will be quite flat. But again, it wasn't it wasn't made for capturing three minute exposures of stars at the edges of the field. <laughs> yeah. No, I all good information. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to mention as well uh, with these small scopes, if you're going to be doing any visual work and um, or if you want to know what you can see with with a small scope, there, there's a book out there. I bought. I was re, it was recommended to me. I went and bought this book. Um, it wasn't very expensive, like I don't know, thirty thirty five dollars something like that. Uh, it, mm -hmm. It's had a few revisions. It's called Turn Left at Orion, and you know you go on almost any Facebook forum, um, uh, and somebody says, uh, I, "I'm getting into astronomy. I have this kind of scope where I just have a pair of binoculars. Uh, uh, can someone recommend a book?" And you'll get like ten posts within half an hour, even less, saying, "Yeah, Turn Left at Orion. That's the book you want to get." Um, fantastic book. It goes through this, the different seasons of the year. Tells you what objects are, are available. Um, the Orion constellation, for example, there's so many double stars and uh, uh, star ar arrangements, like open clusters. Um, that's what I was looking for. Open <laughs> clusters, um, uh, um, and and just objects. So many objects within there's that emission that... nebulae, yeah. reflection nebulae. There's so much going on there. It's it's almost not fair that it's that it's prime time is in the winter when you get the you know generally the fewest clear nights. Yeah, but it was to me it was all these great objects that you can see with a small scope, right. and sometimes only with a small scope because they they are larger objects. Um, so if if you're looking for a book on what to do, you know 
check out that book and there'll be a link on our Facebook page for that book. Um, uh, so you just go, go there. You can be able to pick it up through, uh, through Amazon. Um, but I really recommend that book because not only will it tell you how to, what, you, what it's going to look, uh, what you'll be able to see, but it'll, there's actually sketches in there. So you, it'll show you what it'll look like in a, in a small scope or a pair of binoculars. Um, Cool. Because it's not going to be this big, bright Hubble quality image. Um, it'll be that fuzzy patch, and what that fuzzy patch will look like. And if you had a, uh, a larger scope, like a, like a, uh, an eight-inch Dobsonian, it'll show you what it'll look like in, in that as well. So you get a good comparison as to what what it is. But so I, I would highly recommend that book to anyone who wants to know what they can see with a small scope. It's it's funny how it it's still the best way to portray what you see visually through the eyepiece uh, through a certain scope is by sketching it. There's still no better way to, uh, to show um, how that looks. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I agree. I mean, it, it's not something I do very often, but I've seen when I, I appreciate the people that sketch what they've seen through the eyepiece and, uh, and the, the ones that I have compared uh, when I've seen it, it's like, wow, that, that is what it looks like. So I don't know. Yeah. So I, th I think we've, We've pretty much covered, and then some. Yeah, but you know, let, let's keep the discussion going. If anyone has any questions or want to make some comments, hit us up on our Facebook page, Astor Backyard Podcast, and let us know uh, uh, what you do with your small uh, refractor, or, or if you have a small Mac, um, uh, or even if you have a small little ninety millimeter, one hundred fourteen millimeter. I, I know I said less than ninety, uh, but uh, Newtonian, because uh, those are fairly small. And they can be pretty wide field as well. So, mm -hmm. I really want to know what people are using. Um, Trevor, I, I'm sure you want to know know too. Um, and uh, uh, let, let um, you know, tell us what you've been doing with it and, and how how you travel with it. If do you image with it, send us a picture. Let it let let us uh, let us take a look. Yep. Yeah, and as one final closer. Um... I've recently reviewed the Mead 70 millimeter quadruplet astro astrograph, and uh, I'll re I'll be releasing that um, review on my blog uh, this week, and hopefully a video soon. So if you're interested in that scope, it's an excellent little Apo refractor. That, that's great. All right, everybody, have have a uh, good day, and hope that your nights are clear, because uh, mine haven't been. Um, <laughs> And I'm starting to get a little sad. Yeah. All right, everybody. Um, thanks for listening. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Clear skies. Clear skies.